Human nature is a pretty complicated topic with philosophers whining at each other about it throughout history. Should we have a favorable view of human nature? Or should we look at ourselves with a bit more disdain? And these opinions can change too. I mean, one day we might be pretty optimistic about human nature, but then we'll remember politics exist. Thankfully for us, one of the greatest philosophers of the Enlightenment, David Hume, has an essay that explores some considerations on human nature. It's not so much a grand manifesto on human nature, but rather, just some considerations to keep in mind when you conduct your own inquiry. Also, quick disclaimer here, do not get this edition of Hume's essays. It was only 79 pages. Get this bad boy instead, which is more than 600 pages. So without further ado, let's take a look at human nature. Or should I say, Hume in nature? Yeah, I don't blame you. Welcome back to Philosophy Tunes, the channel best enjoyed with a pre-workout before you hit the gym. I like this one personally. But you aren't here for my workout routine. You're here because you're curious about human nature, so let's get into it. I'm using David Hume's essay entitled, Of the Dignity or Meanness of Human Nature. So Hume starts out the essay talking about how big this issue has been for philosophers and poets. He thinks that those who have skill and rhetoric usually take a positive view of human nature, while those who deal with irony and ridicule seem to align with the negative view. But after this acknowledgement, Hume actually makes a pragmatic consideration. When a man is prepossessed with a high notion of his rank and character in the creation, he will naturally endeavor to act up to it and will scorn to do a base or vicious action, which might sink him below that figure which he makes in his own imagination. So Hume's saying that if you have a positive view of human nature, it's likely you'll be a virtuous person in order to live up to that belief. Cause I mean, if you didn't, then you'd be the odd one out in your worldview. I wonder though, could someone have a negative view of human nature, but be virtuous as a sort of, I'm better than the rest of you guys attitude? Like could someone think, I won't succumb to the same evil tendencies as my peers. I shall be the good exception. What do you think? Which perspective of human nature would encourage someone to be more virtuous in your opinion? But after this pragmatic examination, Hume next says that many of these arguments on human nature are influenced by a method of comparison. Because when we say something is good or bad, we aren't saying that in isolation, but rather we're saying something is good or bad in comparison to something else. Hume even relates this to animals. When we call any animal great or little, we always form a secret comparison between that animal and others of the same species. And it is that comparison which regulates our judgment concerning its greatness. So is an elephant big? Well, what are we comparing it to? A goldfish? Yes. My disdain for Portland, Oregon? No. Now Hume notices that many people base their beliefs on human nature off of comparisons between humans and animals. And this comparison tends to favor humans, because humans got those big brain moments when it comes to intellectual inquiry and problem solving. So this comparison will favor human nature. But there are other comparisons to be made. Many people out there compare human understanding to the idea of perfect wisdom. Now it's obvious that human understanding is gonna fall short when comparing it to perfect wisdom. But when we compare human understanding to animal wisdom, there's still a good difference there. Man falls much more short of perfect wisdom than animals do of man. Yet the latter difference is so considerable that nothing but a comparison with the former can make it appear of little moment. Another comparison being made is between humans and wise humans. Some may say that there are so few wise and virtuous humans that this indicates that human nature isn't really that great. But Hume believes there's a problem here. Hume thinks that we only call someone wise because of its scarcity. Being wise doesn't mean you're smart. Being wise means you're smarter than most people. Scarcity is built into the concept. So that to say that there are few wise men in the world is really to say nothing, since it is only by their scarcity that they merit that appellation. It's like looking at the Olympics and seeing that there is only one gold medal available, then concluding that everyone else in the Olympics is not athletic. The gold medal doesn't mean you're the only good athlete, it just means you're the best of the bunch. Were the lowest of our species as wise as Tully or Lord Bacon, we should still have reason to say that there are few wise men. 
At this point, Hume wants to talk about the only comparison which he really thinks is worth his time. It's not comparing humans to animals, or human understanding to perfect wisdom, or humans to wise humans. It's about comparing the different motives and principles inside of us as humans. So we're comparing evil motives within us with good motives. Is there an imbalance here? Well, Hume starts by saying that affection for others is actually tied to self-love. You show kindness to a friend because they're your friend, and not some random person. You take care of your family because they're your family. If you eliminated self-love from the equation, you might be in a state of inaction. The self-love of everyone, and mine among the rest, will then incline us to serve you, and speak well of you. So how does this recognition of self-love relate back to this comparison of human motives? Well, Hume addresses some philosophers that claim that people do good deeds only to get this feeling of pleasure that self-love involves. Like when you help out a friend, you feel good about that deed, don't you? So is it really a good deed because you're getting this good feeling out of it? Hume still thinks so because it's a chicken and the egg situation. Hume believes that the good deed comes first, then the pleasure of doing the good deed. This is contrasted with a view that the desire for the pleasure comes first, and then that causes you to do the good deed. The virtuous sentiment or passion produces the pleasure, and does not arise from it. I feel a pleasure in doing good to my friend because I love him, but do not love him for the sake of that pleasure. And finally, Hume addresses the criticism that those who do virtuous actions love to be praised. Hume believes that a love for the fame of good deeds is actually pretty similar to the love of the good deed itself. Therefore, it's not so much the fame that should alert us, but what the fame is for. Hume gives the examples of Nero and Trajan, two Roman emperors, both having a love for fame, but one being virtuous and the other being evil. It's not the love of fame that we should look at, but the reason for that fame. To love the glory of virtuous deeds is a sure proof of the love of virtue. And that's the end of the essay. So you still may be yearning for something more clear. Like is this an essay in favor of a positive view of human nature? Well, I see it kind of less as that, but more of simple considerations on the debate which mainly critique the negative view of human nature. But what do you think about Hume's considerations? Also, what do you think about Hume himself? I mean, look at that smile. Is that a face of someone you could hate? Throw me a sub if you enjoyed the video while hitting the like and bell button. And with that, I wish you all a beautiful rest of your day.